the most revered men ever to walk the sidelines at the University of South Dakota has called it a career. How's everybody doing? I'm Jay Elson, and this is Coyote Quarter. Well, just days after the clock struck zero on South Dakota's 2015 football season, Joe Glenn made it official. He announced his retirement from coaching on Monday, closing the book once and for all on a brilliant career that started and finished at USD. In December of 2011, South Dakota talked a Hall of Famer into giving coaching one last shot. Joe Glenn, who'd guided programs at Northern Colorado and Montana to national championships, was tasked with leading the Coyotes, his Coyotes, into a new era. Four years later, there are no regrets on either side. I can't thank Joe enough for everything he's done for this football program, this department, and this university. He has brought a life and an energy that is contagious and is exemplified in his staff and in his players. Joe has elevated this program in ways that aren't easily seen uh, for the, from those outside the department, but I can assure you that what he has done, we should all stand proud to be a Coyote. My chance to come home, to come back here and coach for the Coyotes um, is a dream that I've had for a long time, and, and I just hoped I was young enough um, to, to give it you know, what it needed, and I, I felt we did. I didn't cheat on any part of the drill. Uh, did all the recruiting, did all the home visits, did a lot of car time. Um, so uh, I feel real good um, about having come back here. Glenn says he was never sure exactly how much he had left in the tank, even as the Coyotes started to show significant progress this season. As the weeks wore on, the coach's lifestyle got a little less comfortable. And in the hours that followed the season finale at Illinois State, Glenn finally felt something certain. We just had to let it play out. Michelle Glenn has been through this a thousand times with me and I'd vacillate back and forth a little bit. This is the decision that I came up with uh, in conjunction with my people and um, it wasn't easy. I really do think this game is for a younger guy. And I know in my own life where I was more effective uh, Age-wise was not going to be 67 years old. So uh, it was a time was right. You just feel it. You know it. I've had my chances. I've had my turn at being a head coach. And um, it's time for somebody else to do this job. And we'll get the right person. Another thing Glenn is sure of is that whoever earns the distinction of becoming South Dakota's 30th head coach will inherit a program that's on the rise. This year we started getting over the hump on some big games. I don't think anybody would argue we're a lot closer now than uh, we were four years ago. And uh, in this league that continues to put five teams in the playoffs, um, it's, it's tough sledding. It's really tough sledding. And, uh, but we're on the right track. There's great young players in the system. Uh, you'll see it as time goes. Um, and I have every confidence that we'll just keep getting better and better. So with that, Glenn hands off the keys to his program. As he reflects on his career, he says he's proud of what he's given back to the game, particularly in his time at South Dakota. And South Dakota is proud of him. These young men and all of the athletes at the university and students who've been able to work with you have learned so much from you. I thank you. I thank you for all you have given to us at USD. And like you, I can say, get along, you coyotes, get along. <laughs> now that Glenn's career at USD is complete, we wanted to take a quick look at some of the biggest moments from his four-year run with the coyotes. The first came in just his second game as Glenn led the Yotes to a 31-21 victory over playoff-bound Colgate. South Dakota would notch its first ever Missouri Valley Football Conference win the following season with a 17-14 win over Missouri State on October 5th, 2013. And after a win the following week over Indiana State, the Coyotes made it three straight at Northern Iowa, rallying from a 28-7 third quarter deficit to upset the 13th ranked Panthers 38-31 in double overtime. With that win, the Coyotes snapped an 18 game road losing streak. Glenn's finest moment came nearly two years later as the Coyotes ended nearly four decades of frustration in Fargo, upsetting four-time defending national champion and then second-ranked North Dakota State 24-21 at the Fargo Dome. 
Three weeks later, Glenn would reach a personal milestone, becoming the 76th coach in NCAA history to reach the 200 win plateau. That after the Coyotes rallied past Southern Illinois 34 to 31. Now, Glenn's greatest impact was likely made inside the Coyotes locker room. Find out what his players and coaches had to say about the coach's departure next. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. While Monday's news will be felt throughout the entire South Dakota community, nobody will feel the impact of Joe Glenn's departure more than the players and coaches he's worked with on a daily basis. From the guys he inherited to those he helped bring to South Dakota himself, it's clear that the respect Glenn has earned and the lessons he's taught will last a lifetime. Change can be a difficult pill to swallow. That's the reality players and coaches at the University of South Dakota are dealing with in the wake of Joe Glenn's retirement. It was tough for the coaches because he comes in there and he says, hey guys, this is what's best for us right now. And, um, you know, developed a relationship with Coach Glenn that'll last a lifetime for me. Pretty special. I was just, uh, you know, kind of thinking about the recruiting process, you know, when he recruited us. Um, you know, it's just a little weird that, you know, you've been with the same coach for the last four years and maybe find out something new next year. Uh, but, you know, I'm just glad, all football aside, uh, I'm glad that I met the guy. He's a great guy. He's helped me out so much in life. Uh, he's definitely someone down the road. If I need anything, I can, you know, give him a call right away and he's going to get back to me. He's just that kind of guy. It's just great looking back and uh, saying that, you know, I played for Coach Glenn, just a great guy. He's been a great role model for me. He really changed the culture here. Being a great person, I mean, that's the foundation. That's what it all starts from. And he brought that here at the University of South Dakota, and people followed him. The players we spoke to agree that Glenn's impact on the team, as well as the individuals, was profound. There was nothing he wouldn't do for one of his. And in turn, there was nothing they wouldn't do for him. And that goes so much deeper than wins and losses. This program's a lot better than it was four years ago. And that's all, you know, tribute to Coach Glenn and everything that he brought, you know, the belief that he brought in the players and everything. And everybody else bought it, had to buy into it. So that was important. We all did that. But, you know, he, he kind of initiated that. And um, it's unquestionably better off than it was four years ago. He's done a lot for the players in a sense of just the total buy-in, uh, buying into the strength with Jevin, uh, buying into the locker room, the practicing. Uh, just, it's just no, basically just a total buy-in is what he got. And just guys playing for each other. For those that remain, the charge is simple. Forget the things you can't control. Just do your part to ensure that Coach Glenn's efforts aren't wasted. We're not doing the hiring, that's for the administration. Our job is just to rest up from the season and get ready for the offseason come January. Get bigger, get faster, everything like that, and you know, just continue what he started and continue what he's leaving for us. Yeah, it's going to be important for those guys to do that, to buy into whoever comes in next and whoever takes the reins. Um, there's a lot of great young guys in this program. Um, a lot of great young athletes to be able to do that. Now as Joe Glenn starts being referred to as the Coyotes' former head coach, South Dakota has already begun its search for his successor. Athletic Director David Herbster says there's no concrete timeline to make a hire, but in the words of the legendary John Wooden, says it's important to be quick, but not hurry. We owe uh, this program, the student-athletes, this campus, uh, an incredible coach and so we'll take great care and and time to get it done but you know as you say too you know what is the timeline well the clock's ticking and there's recruiting there's there's 95 faces that need a head coach and so um, we'll get her done I mean I think we've kind of charted out what the the, the qualities that we're looking for and and most of those qualities are exhibited uh, in the guy to my right and so it's not too hard to know what you're what you're looking for and it's you know it's got to be a fit it's got to be a fit for South Dakota it's it's got to be a fit for uh, the culture that has been created here and what we want to continue to um, do here it's you know we'll win and we'll win the right way and you know all those other little intangibles will will fold up into that what will be the biggest challenges facing the Coyotes new head coach we'll talk about that and more with Midco SN analyst Andre Fields after this Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. And hey, welcome back to Kyle Quarter. We've got one more guy who wants to get a chance to weigh in on this whole Joe Glenn retirement thing, and that is 
Big OSN analyst Andre Fields. And, and Andre, before you worked with us and, and, and viewed the Coyotes from this perspective, you were a Coyote yourself. And so your opinion in this matter is important because you played this game at this university. Uh, and so you share that tie with Joe Glenn, even though you weren't there at the same time. So just want to get your thoughts on Joe uh, and his tenure as the head coach at USD. Well, you know, when they hired Joe, I think the biggest thing for us was that he was a coyote. He was one of us. He was like a coyote guy. And just not only that, you know, as a competitor, I got to play against Joe when I was in school. He was coaching at the University of Northern Colorado, and I got to know him then just from his competitive standpoint. And this story always stood out to me, Jay. When we were playing Northern Colorado at the Dome, I made a play. It was a crucial play in the game. And as I came off the field, Joe walked out onto the field and kind of gave me a tap to say, good job. Mm. Never, ever forgot that because he was the only coach that did it. It was those types of things that I think endured him to not only just Kyle players, but Kyle fans, to all the guys who've maybe come in touch with him as a coach or as a former player or as just an ambassador for this university. So I think he really meant a lot, not just from a football standpoint, but just as a Coyote in general. Well, and I, I think just from having the experience myself, too, of traveling with the team over the last four years, everywhere we went, whether it was Montana, obviously Joe had some deep connections there, mm -hmm. or just another team in the Valley. He was respected everywhere we went. And, it, and a lot of it had to do with that personality. I mean, right. he, he could engage anybody regardless of the jersey that they were wearing. Yeah, he kind of had that politician-like personality <laughs> about him. And you need to have that as a head coach, as a CEO of any type of organization. But also, of course, he was very, very successful on the mm -hmm. football field. And that carried a lot of weight also. His tenure in terms of wins and losses, that's ultimately what people are measured on, mm -hmm. fairly and unfairly sometimes. 12-34 and 34 at USD, but he won 200 career games. Obviously the guy, incredible football coach. But the one thing that became apparent as we went through the press conference on Monday was that uh, the word culture kept coming up and people kept talking about how Joe had impacted this program by completely changing the culture. And that says something, I, I think, in a lot of ways as – you know, in a lot of ways, equal to the amount of wins that maybe he came away with, maybe even more impressive. Yeah, absolutely, because you had to create a certain type of culture to have a certain type of environment that has that results in, in winning football games and the such. And I think the one thing about Coach Glenn was that he was the right person for the job at the right time that they needed him. He started the, the, the trek into the Missouri Valley, and we know how strong of a football conference that is. And they needed somebody who was a a strong character, a strong coach that could handle the on and off the field duties of getting a football team to where they need to be. And I think that's one of the things that we can take away from this whole four-year experience is that right now, USD sitting in a pretty good place mm. on the football field. In terms uh, of a player's perspective, now, if you're one of the guys that's coming back, and there are a lot of them, I mean, there's yeah, certainly losing some quality seniors, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of talent coming back on this football team. But if you're a guy right now and your head coach is leaving, what's your biggest reservation uh, about th that change that's about to come. Well, just that, the change that's about to come. You don't know who's going to be your coach. You don't know what type of scheme or system they're going to bring. You don't know if you're going to have that same chemistry with maybe your position coach, depending upon who they bring in or who they keep, et cetera. So all the sweat equity that you've built up trying to get yourself to a position to be a starter or maybe a captain or even to just get some playing time, mm -hmm. they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know if that's in jeopardy. Some of them are going to feel like they have to completely start over, and other guys are going to just wonder, how am I going? to fit what's going to be my niche that's the biggest thing they're thinking about finally outside of recruiting um, when you consider where this team is at the success that they showed this year the improvement that they showed on the football field in 2015 mm -hmm. uh, but you also consider the fact of where the valley is and how yes. potent of a league that this is everybody that's that's well documented <laughs> we don't need to go into detail there but outside of recruiting then what's the biggest challenge for this new coach in your opinion I think the biggest challenge is going to be to not take a step back. I mean, you've already built up this far. You don't want to take any steps back. You don't want to start a rebuilding process. You just want to see if you can pick up the ball and keep advancing it forward. It may only be a yard, may only be two yards, but you want to keep going forward. You don't want to have to start from the bottom or step back at all. All right. Well, good stuff, Andre. Thanks again for your help Absolutely. all season long. It's been a fun ride, uh, to be sure. All right. Well, the Kyle volleyball team bounced back from a slow start to earn the five seed for the Summit League Tournament. We'll recap their run in the Rockies next. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. 
Coyote Volleyball's 1-5 start to the conference season has become a distant memory. After struggling early in league play, Leanne Williamson's team picked up steam, winning seven of their next ten to head into the Summit League tournament with momentum and confidence. The fifth-seeded Coyotes' first test in Denver would be four-seed North Dakota State, a team USD had split with during the regular season. Not surprisingly, the sides would evenly divide the first four games, but it was South Dakota who came through when it mattered most, winning 15-10 in the fifth behind a triple-double of 46 assists, 13 kills and 10 digs from sophomore setter Brittany Jessen, and 18 kills from senior Audrey Reed. With the Bison behind them, USD's path to the conference championship game would go through the hosts. Top seeded Denver had gone 13 and three during Summit League play, including a two and zero mark versus the Yotes, and they'd get out quickly in this one, taking the first two games, 25-13, 25-14. USD would rally to take a game off the Pioneers in the third, but Denver would win Game Four to take the match and advance. They'd go on to win their second straight conference tournament over Omaha one day later. While the Coyotes campaign ended for the third straight season in the conference tournament semifinals, USD did not leave the Rockies empty-handed. Five Coyotes earned hardware at the year-end awards banquet, including all summit nods for Brittany Jessen and Audrey Rieg, all summit honorable mention for Kelsey Biltoft, and, and spots in the all-freshman team for Haley Dotseth and Lauren Madison. Jessen was also named the Summit League's Setter of the Year, the first time a Coyote had won the award. Jessen, who's just a sophomore, had over 1,100 assists this season and averaged 10.82 per set. It's the second most in the Summit League. Well, the Coyote men's and women's basketball team's non-conference schedules are already in full swing. We'll get you updated on the current state of USD hoops when Coyote Corner returns. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. And welcome back. Well, after road losses to Utah and Northern Iowa to open the season, Amy Williams and company were excited to see the return of one of their own for game number three. With conference preseason player of the year, Nicole Seacamp, now back in the fold after a two-game absence, the defending Summit League regular season champs had their full squad on display for the first time this year when they took on Kansas State. The Big 12's Wildcats were unbeaten through their first two contests of the year, but it was the visitors who started stronger. Good ball movement for the Yotes to find Jasmine Trimboli for three. And at Seacamp from the corner, three more. USD would lead by seven at the half, but the Cats would come out of the break firing. Kindred Wiesman knocks down this open look from deep. She was a big part of a 28-point KSU third quarter, and suddenly the Wildcats had built a seven-point lead of their own going into the fourth. No quit though in Amy Williams' crew. Seacamp here with two more of her 20 for the night. And then the senior finds Kelly Stewart for the long three at the top of the key to cut the K-State lead to just two with under two minutes to go. The Yotes would force overtime on three made free throws from Seacamp with three seconds left in regulation. But the Cats would do enough in that extra frame. Another three from Wiesman who'd finished with a career high 28 points, followed by a tough basket inside for 6'5 post Brianna Lewis and that would do it. From Manhattan, Kansas State would hit their free throws down the stretch and pull out the 84-81 overtime win. Seacamp would finish two rebounds shy of a triple-double in her first game of the season, while Caitlin Duffy hit seven threes for a team-high 21 points. The Yotes would set a Bramlage Coliseum record for the most made threes in a game with 17 to go along with 22 assists, but it wasn't enough to earn their first victory of the season. That would come four days later as the Coyotes returned to Vermillion for their home opener against a young Marquette team that was also off to an 0-3 start. USD would shoot it well in this one, starting with Ty Miller off the dish from Nicole Seacamp, two of her 15 points on the night. Seacamp would pour in 16 of her own and record a career-high 12 assists, including another dime here to Caitlin Duffy. The Coyotes would lead by five at the break. It was all USD from there. Seacamp to Margaret McLeod underneath for two of her 10 points. Then Nicole with a swing pass to Trimboli for three. The Iowa Western transfer would finish with 11 off the bench as USD outscores the Golden Eagles 33-16 in the third quarter. Pull away for the 97-69 win. The Coyotes would shoot 57% from the field and from three and would turn the ball over just 11 times, the fewest they've had so far this season. Four Yotes hit double figures while 12 of the 13 who dressed for the game would get in on the score sheet. 
The men were also in Manhattan last week as Craig Smith and company faced a stiff test in Bruce Weber's Wildcats. Early on, though, Yotes holding their own. Freshman Tyler Hagedorn with a three from the quarter. Then DJ Davis, the drive, finds Dan Jack for the lay-in. More slick passing from USD. Shy McClellan dishes to Hagedorn, who hits Jack again. The freshman from Rochester would go for 13 off the bench, and the Yotes would lead 42-39 at the half. It was all K-State after the break, though, as Barry Brown comes on and starts filling it up from outside. He'd go for a team high 18 points in this one as the Cats would take the victory going away 93-72. After shooting 53% from the field in the first half, the Yotes were held to just 34% in the second. Despite the struggles, McClellan would still put up a game-high 20 points in the losing effort. The Coyotes record now sits at one and three, but they'll have ample opportunity to improve that tonight in their first home game of the young season against South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. The Hard Rockers of Rapid City were picked to finish 13th out of 16 teams in Division II's Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference and are currently two and two on the year. Tip-off was at seven o'clock from the Dakota Dome. All right, that is our time for this week. For Alex Heinert, I'm Jay Elson. We are off next week, but we'll be back here to talk more Coyote hoops on Tuesday, December 8th. We'll see you then. So yippee-oh, here we go forward today. South Dakota victory.